I'd like to welcome you back. If you weren't here on Friday evening, um, don't worry, you'll quickly be able to, to tune in to what we're doing. But we're looking at the epistle of Paul, the apostle, to Titus. So as far as possible, every man and woman and boy and girl needs to have Titus open in front of us. And we're going to do chapter 2 in this service together. In chapter 1, because remember, it's when the church is in a mess. In chapter 1, the apostle said, this is where we begin. First of all, we think great thoughts. In other words, think gospel. Then we get the right men into leadership. In other words, think church. And then we declare war on false teaching. In other words, think godliness. Now we come to chapter 2. When the church is in a mess, this is what we do next. And ladies and gentlemen, the church often is in a mess. The church in the 21st century, almost everywhere in the world, is in a mess. Most churches don't know what God expects of them. They don't know why they're here. They don't know what their great pri priorities should be. They don't know what they should be against and what they should be for. And as Spurgeon said, in a different context, they stand for nothing and fall for everything. And here the apostle is telling us what to do when the church is in that sort of bewildered and confused condition, where things are wrong in the church, where things which should be there have been left out for a long time. So this is what we do next. And this morning in this sermon, there are two points. First of all, we show each sort of person what God expects of them. And that's going to be verses 1 to 10. Now just look around the church building this morning, if you dare. There are very different sorts of people here. Some like black, some like red, some like orange, and we're already very different. The greatest difference is, of course, we're men and women. Some of you are men, or going to be, and some of you are women, or going to be. Going to be. Men, men don't listen. Women, women can't read maps. <laughs> Men, they open the fridge and they can't see what's straight in front of them. Women, they have to reverse their car into a parking space and it takes about 88 tries. <laughs> there are massive differences between men and women. And God does not expect certain things of women that he expects of men. And God does not expect of men certain things that he expects of women, as we're going to quickly see this morning. Now, so we're men and women, or going to be. Some of you are old. I know that because you're older than I am. And some of you are young. God does not expect from old people some of the things that he expects from young people. But God does not expect from young people some of the things he expects from old people. That's in these ten verses. So we have to show to each sort of person what God expects of them. Otherwise there is no chance whatever that the church will ever get sorted out. So here we go, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. We show each sort of person what God expects of them. And it starts like this. But as for you, that's Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Whatever else the false teachers or anybody else is preaching, you, Titus, preach truth and teach the sort of behaviours which are in line with truth. And now he spells them out. He starts with the older men. What's an old man? Years ago, I was asked to do a study on what the Bible teaches about young people. So you have to ask the question, what are young people? What does the Bible say? Is it 17 and down, or 21 and down, or what is it? The Bible doesn't give an answer. It just says, young people, is anyone younger than you are? What's an older man? Well, an old, a man who's older than you are, probably. If there are more young people here 
who, but that is people who are below your age, you're an old man, join the club. This is for you. And what Paul has to say in verse 2 is for every older man. So, gentlemen, what we're going to do now is for you and for me. Not just for the elders, not just for the deacons, not even just for the church members. For every older Christian man, this is what God expects of you. And it's there in verse 2, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Sober, of course, means here, not that you don't get drunk, but that you're just straightforwardly sensible. I woke up this morning and said to my wife, how are you today, eccentric old lady? <laughs> and she said, I may be eccentric, but you are mad. <laughs> and then I was rebuked. Because an older Christian man, that's precisely what he shouldn't be. He's expected to be sensible, self-contained, a man filled with self-mastery, in control of himself, never over the top. And we're told here, verse 2, he's to be reverent, which of course means serious about his Christian faith. Now I come from the United Kingdom, if you haven't get, yet guessed. In our country, people often mix up serious and somber. The Bible never tells people to be somber, but serious. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll tell you about a Christmas card. I saw this Christmas card, it attracted me, so I bought it and sent it to a friend. It was long and thin. It had one picture on it. It was a man dressed in black. He had a very tall top hat, black a long Abram Lincoln jacket, black. Trousers, black. Shoes, black. Bow tie, black. And the artist was a genius because this man had the most miserable face that I've ever seen, ever. <laughs> and the caption on the Christmas card was, Christmas cheer. And some people think that's what Christians are supposed to be like. Serious means that the things of God are more important to you than anything else in the whole world. But it does not mean, of course, going through life like the man on the Christmas card. And older men are expected to behave as if the, old, the things of God were the most important things in the whole world. That there is nothing, nothing, nothing at all in the same category. And that's what the Apostle is saying here. So you're to be master of yourself and filled with seriousness and temperate. You've got no appetite which is out of control, no habit which you're, no ma which you're not master of. Then he says, sound in faith, in love, in patience. If you study the New Testament, you'll probably get a little bit of a surprise at that point. Why is that? Well, Paul normally talks about faith, hope, love. Those are his three. But three times in 1 Timothy, once in 2 Timothy... And here, he talks not about faith, hope, love, but there it is, verse 2, faith, love, patience, endurance, perseverance, stickability. Why does he say that to older men? Because older men often fall into spiritual erosion. They're keen as young Christians. But as the years go by, they get less and less keen and something's just wearing away on their spiritual life. And often they end up as a spiritual disappointment. 
And the apostle says, faith, love, patience, that is endurance, that is perseverance. You keep soldiering on, just like you always did, and you never let things slip, because what you do at the end of your life is vital. And if you do it badly, you can undo all the good that you did in your younger life. When I was a young pastor, I was very influenced by a, an older pastor. One thing he taught us was the importance of church. Then he retired and never went to church again till the day he died. How much good did you think, do you think that did? What did people think of the previous 40 years when he stressed the importance of church? I know of a man who pastored a church for 40 years and kept stressing the importance that Christians of whatever, whatever their, their denomination and background, as long as they love the cross of Christ, should stand together. But insisted when he retired that a good number of the people should follow him because he would pastor another church in his retirement which he would, he would start from scratch and succeeded in splitting the church which he had pastored for 40 years. What do you think that did to the previous 40 years of his ministry? I know of a man who preached on our beaches in Britain and hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands actually came to Christ under his preaching. But when he got older, he denied the existence of hell. What do you think that did? to all the people who come to Christ through his preaching. We say in Welsh, any fool can begin well. But what about ending? And the apostle is saying to the older men, you older men, take care that you finish well. The older women, likewise. And now we move to verse 3. What's he got to say to the older ladies? Let's read what it says. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behaviour. When you look at their life, the way they carry themselves, the things that they think about, the priorities they keep, you can only come to the conclusion that they are holy women. Not slanderers, because some older ladies have time on their hand, and what do they talk about? others, and not always very nicely, not given to much wine. I don't think most women here are probably going to end up drinking themselves under the table. But maybe there are some excesses which you didn't permit yourself when you were younger, but now you're an older lady, you think that it's, it's probably all right. And into your life has crept the sin of self-indulgence. Teachers of good things. Because every older lady in this building this morning is a teacher. Not a teacher from the pulpit. Maybe not a teacher in a Bible class or Sunday school. But every woman in the building who's older is a teacher. By your example, the things that you do, the things that you don't do, the things that you speak about, the places that you go, the clothes that you wear, the language that you use, all the time you're teaching something to others and they are noticing it and absorbing it and taking it on board. So make sure, says the Apostle, that all the older women only teach good things. In other words, give an example which the younger women can follow easily. And not just give them an example. Get near to the younger women and teach them. And there Paul builds a bridge. He's telling the older women that every single older woman without an exception, and anyone who is an exception is sinning, every older woman is to teach younger women how to live the Christian life. 
and especially to teach them about these seven things. And in mentioning these seven things, he then shows the younger women what is expected of them. Would you like to see what they are now in verse 4? That they admonish the younger women to love their husbands. Let me tell you about Sally. My wife spent time with Sally once or twice a week for a couple of years. Sally loves to talk about her husband. She's infatuated. She's infatuated with her husband. Obsessed with her husband. She talks about her husband morning, afternoon and evening. When she's in company, she talks about her husband. When she's on a one-to-one, -one, she talks about her husband. Probably she talks to herself about her husband. How lazy he is. How idle. How irresponsible. How thoughtless. How unpunctual. How sloppy. How untidy. That's what she says. What impression is she giving? She's a Christian woman! Who's going to put us straight? The pastor? You don't understand my problems, pastor. So the older women get close and they take Sally aside and say, come on now, Sally, think about this. Think about what you're doing. Is this loving your husband? Is it? Let's go on. Verse 4. Teach them to love their children. Let me tell you about Maggie. Maggie thinks that it's more important that her three children should have a bedroom of their own each than that they should have a mother who's regularly part of their life. So she works every hour she can and then when she comes home studies as hard as she can so they can get much more money, as much money as she can so that eventually her three children can have a bedroom of their own. Often she's not there when the children go to school and often, very often in fact, she's not there when the children come home. She seldom cooks a meal for them. It's often done by the grandparents. Is she loving her children? Is she really loving her children? What do you think? And who will tell her? And this is a sort of nitty-gritty, down-to-earth teaching which the Apostle is giving about how things are put right in the church. Every single person in the church has got a job to fulfill and this is what God expects from each sort of person. You older women, you need to speak to Maggie and Maggie needs to pay attention to this sermon because she's missing her true calling. Verse 5, these younger women are to be discreet tactful. They're to be chaste, pure. They're to be home makers. Before we married, I was a single pastor. I lived in Toxtus, which doesn't mean a thing to folk in North America, but it would do if I said I lived in Harlem. I'll tell you about the house I lived in. It was small. It had four walls and a floor and a ceiling and a roof. That's about all you can say about it, really. And then I married. And that house became a home because there is a genius in womanhood. I don't know what it is, it defies description. But just a wife coming into this four walls, floor and ceiling, suddenly the place becomes a, a home. I think you men who've been single and now married know what I'm talking about. You women may not know that you've got that magic touch, but you have, and we haven't. If you don't believe me, go and visit some single fellow here and see what his place is like. And because that is a woman's distinctive genius, for the glory of God, she should exercise that genius. And she should give her first energies to building a home where husband and children are comfortable 
and where other people are frequently given a temporary place in the family, which is what we call hospitality. These are the sort of things which are to be taught. No church has ever thrived where hospitality was not a regular part of the church's fellowship. And that requires the Christian women to bring about. Look at verse 5. What else will these young women be? Good, which means kind, obedient to their own husbands, which is a terribly bad translation. The Greek is submissive to their own husbands. Obedience is where Mr. Husband walks in and says, do this, do this, do this. Yes, Sergeant. Submission is where a woman says to her husband, this is who I am, this is what I am, this is what I have, and it's my gift to you. And there's a million miles of difference between those two attitudes. The New King James Version, which I also use, is not a very good translation there. But here's the important bit. Look at it in verse 5. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. Do you know that the younger women of Grace Reformed Baptist Church Rockford have it in their power to ruin the gospel witness of this church. Simply by being like other people. And when the watching world looks at the Christian women and sees that really they are indistinguishable from the unconverted world, the world quickly draws the conclusion that actually the gospel isn't a big deal. It doesn't really change people. It doesn't really do anything radical and life transforming. It's not really worthy of serious attention. And they speak ill of the word of God simply because of what they see in the lives of the lady church members. And the mess will never be sorted out, says the Apostle Paul, until men and women, old and young, do what God expects of them. Wait a minute, somebody says. You haven't mentioned the young men. Verse 6. Likewise, exhort, encourage, get on the back of the young men to be sober-minded. Are you men feeling relieved that that's all he says about the young men? But it's very searching. If I see a car racing down the road and turning the corner on two wheels, who's the driver? If I see a crowd of soccer fans, see I know how to say soccer, we say football because it is, if I see a crowd of soccer fans having a fight with another crowd of soccer fans, who's doing the fighting? If I go to prison to visit somebody, what age profile and what sex pro profile do the majority of the offenders have? They're nearly all young men, aren't they? Nearly all. And what's wrong with them? They don't want to grow up. They don't want to carry the responsibilities of maturity. When I was young, we used to have in our churches young people's fellowships. You were expected to leave them when you're 18. I know young people who moan, young men that is, when they have to leave the young people's fellowship at 32. They want to be treated like young men forever and ever. It's what we call in our culture, ladism. And the Apostle Paul is saying there is no place for that amongst Christian young men. Christian young men have got to learn to grow up and be the men that God's designed them to be to carry their responsibilities with joy and resilience and humour but to carry their responsibilities. Yes, to do it with energy but to be men nonetheless. Exhort them, Timoth Tim Titus. Exhort them. Tell them this. But make sure, there it is, in verse 7, that you yourself are giving the lead and setting the example. Your life will teach them as much as your lips. And don't let your life, Titus, contradict what your lips say. And as for you, Titus, and anybody else here who preaches, this is what God expects of you. 
your manner of teaching, verse 7, should be integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. You teach in such a way that people know that what you have to say is important. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if I preached to you on the doctrine of hell, but told a few very funny jokes as I did it, that I would undo everything I was saying to you. Not by what I was saying, but by the manner in which I said it. The manner's important, but so is what you teach, Titus, verse 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, have nothing evil to say of you. Because when the preaching is serious and the life of the preacher is godly and when the content of the preaching is truth, most of our opponents are silenced. If we were writing the epistle to Titus, we would stop there. But Paul doesn't, does he? In our families, there's mum and dad and children. But in first century families, there was mum and dad and children and slaves. You can only have slaves if you think that somehow they're an inferior sort of creature, that you're fully human, but somehow they're less human. So the Roman world spoke to them and spoke about them as if they were a lesser form of creature. But the Apostle Paul doesn't. He speaks to them with full-blooded imperatives and commands just like he speaks to everybody else. And in that way he dignifies them and these two verses together with half a dozen others were the means by which slavery became completely banished from the Roman Empire. Because once you start treating slaves like fully-fledged, 100% humans, slavery can't continue anymore. So he tells them to be obedient to their masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, to not answer back, to not steal things around the house, but to be always reliable. And then he tells them that even you slaves, look at it, you may adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour, in all things. He's told us that the young women can ruin the gospel witness. And now he tells us that the slaves can actually make the gospel doctrine which we preach appear beautiful. Imagine I have in my hand a pile of diamonds. I don't. And I just drop them down. They will sparkle and you'll catch something of their beauty, but not really very much. Now imagine that I take exactly the same diamonds and arrange them in a crown. When you come to Britain, by the way, come and see the crown jewels which our queen wears. It'll cost you a fortune to see them, but it keeps our taxes low. then when you've got exactly the same jewels arranged, you can see them in their true beauty. And frankly, when older men and younger men and older women and younger women and slaves and those who preach all live in the way that God expects them to live, the gospel shines as a very beautiful and attractive thing indeed. And before all who see it, and before all who come into contact with Christians, they can see something of the wonder and uniqueness of the gospel message which we love to proclaim in our churches. And Paul is once more showing us that Christian behaviour and Christian witness are so linked together that we dare not separate them. That's what he says in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2. So, here it is. We... We show each sort of person what God expects of them. And frankly, no one should go away from a passage like that the same as they were before. But the chapter doesn't end there. So here's our second point. 
We show each sort of person what God expects of them and we tell them why. And verse 11 starts, for. You tell them to live like this and this and this and this and this because, for. And then once more, we're in one of these great gospel paragraphs where our minds are filled once more with enormous thoughts. And then at last we understand why men and women, old and young, and servants and preachers, all have to live like that. Not because the pastor lays down the rules and says, you do this, you do that, but because of some other great reason which conquers us completely, which is the reason why we have to live in the way that we have to live. So we're now going to look at verses 11 to the end of this chapter. And once more I want to stress that we've got to get rid of this do, do, do preaching which simply lays down duties and does not give gospel reasons for the duties. So we're in chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to read it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Very strong paragraph, don't you think? Something has happened. We live differently because something has happened. God's grace has appeared. God loved the world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. God's kindness has appeared. It was fleshed out in the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself was manifest in the flesh. There's a life we should have lived. He lived it for us. There's a death we deserve to die. He died it for us. We're saved by a saviour. And the grace of God has appeared in our own lives. 2,000 years later, we've been brought to close in on this Jesus Christ and throw ourselves into his care and rely upon him completely and to believe that he lived for us and to believe that he died for us and to believe that we can come to God through him because he still lives in the power of an endless life to save all who will come to God by him. And God's grace has appeared in our life and we've been brought to this holy Christ who died for sin and came to save sinners. God's grace has appeared and we can't live as if it hadn't. And that grace teaches us. Negatively, verse 12, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And sometimes young people ask me what ungodliness is. I tell them about my dog. I was given a dog. I was a single man and I was given a dog. It was an ungodly dog. It was. It got up in the morning and said nothing to God. I gave it porridge and it never thanked the Lord and the porridge was good, believe me, especially with demerara sugar on it. And it had biscuits and it never thanked God for the biscuits. And it had meat and bones and it never thanked God for the bones. And it went to bed at night, it walked around in circles endlessly before it went to bed and it never said a prayer. And unlike Spurgeon's dog, it never went to church and never showed any desire to want to go to church. It was an ungodly dog. And that's what ungodliness is. 
It's un-Godliness. Organizing your life and running your day and living your affairs and leaving God out of it. And the grace of God teaches us that we can't live like that. Negatively, we, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. What is the world? The world is ungodly people doing things together without reference to God. And they do, you know. They travel in cars together and they work together and they do sports together and they do this and this and this and this and together they have no acknowledgement of God and they leave him out. And we can't live like that because the grace of God has appeared and appeared to us. Positively, the grace of God teaches us in ourselves, verse 11 and verse 12, to live soberly. In society, to live righteously. And in the secret of our heart, looking up to heaven, to live godly in the present age. And the grace of God has not only appeared, but the one who appeared for us and who's come to live in our lives, he will come the second time and people will be planning weddings and repairing their cars and doing their washing and watching their sports and adjusting their televisions and fighting their wars. And suddenly into the blue will burst Jesus Christ and the world will end. And one angel appeared to Daniel and it was such a terrible sight that he was like dead. But when he appears, he will come with 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It will be the appearing of, in the glory of the great God and Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't live as if that isn't going to happen. That's what Paul is saying. And who is this one who's coming again? Who is he? Verse 14. That one gave himself for us. That one bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood he gave himself for us he redeemed us it's there in verse 14 and he didn't save us from our sins so that we should go on living in sin He came to redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. The Saviour came because sin is horrible. Ladies and gentlemen, sin is horrible. And we can't live as if it wasn't. And we can't live as if the price paid for our sins was something light and small. Speak these things. And if there are preachers here, the word of God is saying to you, speak these things. Exhort, it says, verse 15. Which means preach it in an encouraging way. Rebuke, it says. Preaching it in a blunt, confrontational way. But preach it with all authority. Because we preachers didn't put ourselves into this work. We didn't go looking for it. We didn't even want it. But the constraint to do it was bigger than we are. And Christ himself sent us into this work and we can't preach as if he didn't. When George Whitfield first came to the United States of America, to the North America as it was in those days, the high society went to hear him preach. And while he preached, the ladies powdered their faces. And the young men sniggered behind their hands. And the old men yawned and tried to look interested and passed each other notes about their finances and their businesses and their social engagements. 
and George Whitfield preached. Eventually he stopped and he looked them in the eyes with his fiery gaze and stamped with his foot on the floor and said, if I was here as a mere philosopher with the word of men, you could powder your faces and pass your notes but I have come to preach to you the word of the living God and I must and will be heard. And that is exactly the spirit that Paul is telling Titus to use as he preaches the word of God. Let no one, let no one despise you. And so ends this magnificent chapter 2 which goes over the whole range of Christian duties. Talks about the incarnation and the atonement and the second coming and indwelling grace and its educating power and the extraordinary, radical, life-transforming nature of the gospel. And it's only when all those things are put before us that we understand all these precise duties which are laid for us in this chapter. So where have we come to so far in these sermons? When the church is in a mess, where do we start? We think great thoughts, we get the right men into leadership and we declare war on false doctrine. And how do we continue? We show each sort of person what God requires of them and we tell them why. And we focus especially on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the greatest need of the church always is in its thoughts and in its affections to come back to the cross of Calvary. Let us pray.